Are you looking for a sport watch, but from all the choice available on the market, you don't really know what to pick? Well, I can understand you so much because I tested all of those watches. In the last two years, I really unbox them, review them, and make tutorial video on them on my multiple YouTube channels. What you are about to see is probably the most complete purchase guide for a sport watch on YouTube. It is chaptered in 40 points so that you can find what you're really looking for. I will talk about the features that I like the most that I absolutely want to have on my next watch and the one that I want to avoid at all cost. All that has been made with my experience with Garmin, Koros, Polar and Sunte. So are you ready? Let's go! My name is Pascal and today we're going to talk about watches. But not just any type of watches, we're going to talk about sport watches, especially the one with the GPS. And this video is probably the one that I've worked on the most on this channel, as in the last year I bought all of these watches to test them one by one to be able to make the most complete video possible. And actually I did test more watches than this because I already sell back some of them. In this video, I don't want to suggest you any specific watch model. I simply intend to go through all function and features that you can expect from a watch so that you can make a wise choice. Because the best watch for me is not necessarily the best watch for you. I can tell you in advance that my personal watch, the one that I use in everyday life when I'm not testing one to make you a review, is that big rock on my wrist. I like big watches with big screen because I like the look of it and it's very practical to see topography in the mountains. But I'm very aware that it's probably the opposite of what anyone who wants to run or probably any woman is looking for because you are looking for something very lightweight or we don't have the same wrist size. Of course, for every watch I test, I do a complete review and several tutorials video. You can find them with a link in the description, but I'll come back to it at the end of the video. I promise that you won't see the time pass, but as the video is very long, I took the time to chapter it. So if you want to skip straight to a point that you really looking for, or if I ever talk about something you totally don't care, drag your mice or your finger in the timeline at the bottom of the video or down below in the description to see the table of content. But the one thing that is sure is that at the end of the video, sport watches will have no more secrets for you. And I'm still going to give you some model suggestions at the end of the video. And you will see that when we talk about sport watches, there is a lot more to talk about than their sport mode. Let's start without further ado with the first point of that video, which is why to buy a sport watch. My first personal reason is because it makes me want to move. Since January 1st of 2020, I have been doing at least one physical activity a day and a part of my motivation come from the fact that I'm proud to look at my Strava calendar and see that I'm really moving every day without exception. Your future watch should be able to follow you everywhere no matter what sport you do. Walking, running, cycling, hiking, kayaking, swimming, crossfit, weight training, treadmill, climbing, or even pedal boating if you want. Your watch should be able to monitor the distance you travel, the number of steps you take, your heartbeat, your respiration per minute, your elevation gain, and a lot more. You can participate in challenge to make that crazy distance this month or to make the equivalent in elevation gain of Mount Everest next week or you can even use it to compete with your friends and family to see who will go the furthest this month. Seeing a year-to-date compilation of everything you have done this year is also very rewarding. Beside all the fun of it, you can also buy a watch to improve yourself by analyzing very advanced statistics. Most watches come with training programs that are able to follow you and suggest activities to do every day to keep you in shape or to achieve a goal like running a marathon, perhaps. For my part, I also see it as a navigation tool. 
Today we have watches with a complete mapping system that are able to plot routes to take you to your goal right on your watch. Or to help you go back to your car by the shortest route or the flattest one if it please you. Navigation saved my life twice in mountains. Hans, I had simply walked away from the trail without noticing it and, well, I lost myself. So the only thing I had to do after that, after that moment of panic, was to take a look at my watch and come back to the trail following my steps. The other time I was in a snowstorm on the top of a mountain. It was so strong that it erased my footprints in less than one minute and we couldn't see anything more than 10 meters in front of us. Once again, the only thing I needed to do was to take a look at my watch and follow my breadcrumb. So, in a way, it's also a safety tool that can save your life. Some watches can also share your geolocation in real time with the people you want. And you can also send a message with your geolocation to your emergency contact if the watch ever detects you have an incident. Please note that not all watches do have those functions, but we will talk about it in the next few minutes. Next point, the glass. And if you've been following me for a while, you know what I'm talking about. No matter what watch I buy for myself, it must have a sapphire crystal glass. Why? Because it's simply the most scratch resistant glass you can find on a watch. If you look at any luxury watch, I mean, the watch that show you the time with ends, those watch, they are all made with no exception, well, maybe very few, with sapphire crystal glass. Sapphire crystal glass is not something that is found in nature. It is a mineral manufactured in factory by a very complex process. And the result is this ultra resistant glass. Basically, if you want to know what is the scratch resistance of a mineral, there is what is called the Mohs scale. It ranks the scratch resistance of minerals from the weakest, the talc, to the strongest, the diamond. Well, on this scale, the sapphire crystal is just below the diamond. So this means that in nature, there is absolutely no mineral that is more resistant than sapphire crystal, except the diamond. But what this means in everyday life? It means you don't have to be super careful every day to not knock it on the door frame, or it means that you can take it to that obstacle course you have next week because you don't really have to care about not scratching your screen. It will not happen, probably. I have worn a watch on my wrist with a sapphire crystal glass almost all the time for the last 10 years and never ever has one of my watch been scratched. At least for its glass. About the case, that's another story. And it's not because I didn't give them a chance to break. This watch, for example, while I was still an employee, I was wearing it every day to work. I drill to concrete, I pass my hands into very small uh, hole, uh, I, I was carrying charge, uh, I, I knock it countless time and the glass is still impeccable. Oh, and this one, <laughs> one day I was doing my bike ride and while jumping on the curb, um, I lost my balance. I tilt on the left, but instead of falling, I tip over the ramp on my left. Well, I was on a bridge. And the only point of contact between me and the bridge was the watch. I was sliding against the bridge on the ramp with the watch sliding on it for at least five meters. And the glass is always impeccable. The same cannot be said about the bridge because I had to scrub a lot on the watch to remove some part of it that was melted onto it. Of course, that has scratched the bezel a lot, but the screen is still impeccable. When I buy a watch for a few hundred dollars or even in the thousand, the last thing I want is that every time I look at it, I see a big scratch. So I always, Always, always pick a sapphire crystal glass. 
Okay, crystal glass does not only have advantage. It is very expensive to manufacture. So much that if a watch gives you the option of having this famous glass, you may find that this option will cost you more than some entry-level watch. That is to say that if we pick the Garmin Phoenix 7X, the upgrade alone just to go from the 7X to the 7X Sapphire, worth half the price of this whole Garmin for Runner 55. But hey, certainly it is less frustrating to have a scratch on the glass of a $260 watch than a $1,000 watch. Just ask yourself before buying it, are you ready to have scratches on it if it doesn't have a sapphire crystal glass? Sapphire crystal glass is also slightly heavier, this is why you won't find the option of having it on some watch specifically made for runners. Finally, some says it is less resistant to impact than its biggest competitor, Corilla Glass. Maybe I never pushed the test far enough to find out. Maybe I should have some fun hitting my watches with a hammer or deliberately drop them on rocks. But I remind you that we are talking about watches here. It's not the kind of thing you accidentally drop. It is trapped on your wrist all day. Moreover, most sport watches have a screen slightly embedded in the watch with a flat surface so the glass remains very well protected against the famous potential impact. As for the famous Gorilla Glass, yes, it's still a very resistant glass. This is the glass you found on most phones, but when I look at mine, if you forget the broken corners because because I drop it many times, you can see that the scratch resistance is far from being extraordinary. It has micro scratch everywhere. But the huge advantage of Gorilla Glass over Sapphire Crystal is that it is way much transparent. It is indeed much easier to read the screen because it is clearer and reflect way less light. And yes, the difference is this quite obvious. But would you rather have reflections starting today or scratches from tomorrow? So in short, when I choose my watch, I always pick the Sapphire Crystal Glass option. And if it's not an option available, I just pick another watch. But do what you want with that information. I'm just giving it to you before you buy your next watch. If you don't pick the Sapphire Crystal option, I just don't want you to come to me crying because you scratch your watch. If you pick another material in Sapphire Crystal, it is not a question of if, but a question of when before you scratch your watch. And please, don't tell me about the $5 protector screen that you can find on Amazon. There's a reason why you don't see ketchup in five-star restaurant. <laughs> Now let's move on to the third point, the size of the watch. And here, although each size has its advantage and disadvantage, it's above all a matter of taste. Personally, I always liked big watches. I find them physically more attractive and I like the fact of having this big rock on my wrist. Having a big watch in this case also allow me to have a bigger screen. This is very useful for displaying more data on the same screen or displaying larger data. For example, when I ride my bike, I put a screen with one large data, two medium and three small. This allows me to easily read my heart rate, speed and distance while riding at full speed and I can focus on reading at lower pace my average speed, my altitude and the time. On the other hand, when I'm doing slower speed activities such as walking or hiking, I can still allow myself with my healthy young eyes to put up to nine very small data that I can access at all the time and I can read with ease. But if you worry about the size of the watch on your wrist and are looking for a point of reference, this is the Garmin Tactic 7 and my wrist does a circumference of around 170 millimeters. It's a 51 millimeter watch. In my opinion, when you wear it for the first time, it feel very big, but it only took me a few hours to get used to it. Today, I hardly feel it on my wrist anymore. 
Well, that said, there are still some disadvantages of having a big watch on your wrist. It can get cumbersome when you do certain tasks. I remember when I was working as IT, I needed some time to remove it to squeeze my arm into very tight spaces. If you do a lot of manual work, a big watch might not be the best thing for you. But actually, in my case, the only time it bothers me is at the gym. The dumbbell in certain positions smash against the watch. So, in those situations, I just put it underneath like that, and it's fine. But that's my only problem, actually. And we now have reached the fourth point of that video and we will now talk about two indivisible factors. The weight and the build quality of the watch. Usually, the heavier your watch is, the better quality it is. And it makes sense when you think about it. If you want a beautiful watch built from premium material, you will often see titanium and sapphire crystal glass. Titanium, for example, although it's very resistant and light for a metal, it is far from being as light as plastic. <laughs> plastic. This is the material that is most often found on watches intended for runners. And it works very well. Plastic watches are extremely light. They were designed with the aim of being light. That doesn't mean they are bad quality, but that's your call if you want to spend big money on a plastic watch. Personally, I just can't. But I must admit that I very quickly forget its weight on the wrist. But we're not all the same. One of the lightest watch I have tested is the Sunto 5 Peak. 39 grams. But I immediately return it. It had reached my limit of cheapness. Very light, but also felt very fragile. The Garmin Forerunner 55, for example, weighs only 37 grams. But I'm not afraid of breaking it when I'm handling it. So if you want a light watch, make sure you pick one with a great quality of plastic in assembly. By comparison, this is the 37 gram Forerunner 55, and this is my 89 gram Garmin Tactic 7. But in the end, it's a personal choice you have to make. A lightweight plastic watch, or a heavier watch made with premium material. Only you know. Point number five, the type of screen. And there is two types of screen that you will most often found on a sport watch. The first one is the MIP and the second one is the AMOLED. MIP, AMOLED, but what does it mean? Well, first of all, MIP is for memory in pixel and AMOLED is for active matrix Organic light emitting digits. AMOLED. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but still, what does it mean? Well, let's start with the AMOLED screen. At first glance, it's most certainly the screen that you will pick because it is unquestionably the most beautiful one. It offers beautiful color in addition to impeccable readability from the darkness of your room to the sunniest mountain peak. The secret behind this technology is that each pixel on the screen produce its own light. We then find pure blacks and brilliant color of perfect accuracy. On the other hand, all of this come at a very high cost and I'm not just talking about your wallet. I'm talking about energy consumption. Because as each pixel creates its own light, that means that every pixel that is turned on consume energy every second that it remain on, and it consume a lot of energy. To save some energy, you usually have two options. The first one is to set the screen in a mode in which it will only turn on when you're looking at it. So, looking at it, not looking at it. But looking at it, not looking at it. The second option is to live with the fact that your battery will drain quickly. 
The screen will remain on all the time, but if the manufacturer has done its job well, you will notice some little things that will allow the battery to drain itself a little more slowly. The pixel will light up a little bit less when you're not looking at them. They are always on, but just less on when you're not looking at it. The background is also black because a black pixel means a pixel at rest. And if we take a look at that one, for example, you can see that the inside of the hours goes empty to consume even less. For the MIP screen, on the other hand, the color are much more duller. It's not unpleasant to watch unless you're already used to the comfort of the AMOLED screen. But side by side, the MIP screen looks really miserable. But trust me, it's not that bad. In fact, the watch I choose as my everyday watch has a MIP screen. It is very visible under the sun. In fact, the brighter it is, the better you can see it. It gets messed up in the dark where it's absolutely impossible to read the screen. It is then necessary to activate the backlight with a click of a button. Good watches will give you the option to turn on automatically the backlight when you're looking at it, above the same principle of the AMOLED screen, and the best one will let you do it only if the sun is set and we can push it a little bit further to do it only when you are into a sport activity. This is, in my opinion, an option that I consider essential. Trust me, you don't want to have to press a button every single time you want to see your speed while you are biking at night. The strong point of the MIP screen versus the AMOLED is that it consumes very little energy. In fact, it only consumes power when there is a change to be made on the screen. So once a minute for the hour and whenever necessary for other data such as the altitude and the earth rate. But don't get me wrong, it only consumes energy for the portion of the screen that is changed. It is the change in the state of the pixel that drains the battery. And since most of the pixel of the watch are static, it is therefore very energy efficient. Except when you use the backlight. At this very moment, you must fall at the consumption equivalent of an AMOLED screen. But that only lasts few seconds every time you watch it. In summary, if you never do an activity that lasts more than a day, and you don't mind about recharging your watch very often, well, the AMOLED screen is probably the right choice for you. On the other hand, if you are the type to go on expedition, or you simply want to recharge your watch the less often possible, well, the MIP screen is made for you. And be careful, I want to be clear on the point. Unless you go on an ultra-connected smartwatch, like an Apple watch, a GPS sport watch, it can have an MIP screen or an AMOLED screen, it should give you way more than a day of charge depending on what you do with it. For example, the Garmin Epix, it's the one with its AMOLED screen that I'm showing you since the beginning of that chapter, will give you few days to maybe a little more over a week of battery lifespan, depending on what you do with it. But on the other hand, if we take the Garmin Enduro 2, for example, with its MIP screen, this one will give you weeks of battery lifespan and maybe even over a month if you don't use the GPS. But I guess that most people that buy that kind of watch use the GPS. At least, I do. <laughs> Which brings us to the next point, the GPS. And what might seem to be one of the most important points to discuss in this video is, in my opinion, one of the most trivial. Because in general, it works very well no matter what watch you use. Almost. What is really important is to verify that the watch you use record your geolocation every single second. 
Very important because if it doesn't, you will end up with a GPS track that look like this. In this example, my position was probably recorded approximately every 30 seconds or maybe even after a minute. As you can see, it seems that I traveled in straight line and deviated a few degrees regularly. So not only it looks stupid on the map, but the distance travel is disordered because as all the curves of the trail are not recorded, you can very quickly notice a difference with the distance actually travel and this generally downwards. Also, as the real-time speed broadcast on your watch is based on your actual geolocation and the previous point recorded, that is to say that if one second ago you were 2.5 meters to the west, you travel at a speed of 9 kilometers per hour. So if your watch check your geolocation every 30 seconds, well, your actual speed, you can forget about it. Almost all watches check your geolocation every seconds, but beware, some watches don't do it by default. And now about GPS, GLONASS and Galileo, in my experience, it's not very important. I'll quickly explain how GPS system works in case you don't know. And be careful, I'm not an engineer either, so I might do some little mistakes in what I explain. There are plenty of satellites in the sky. All satellites and all objects that connect to them, such as your watch, operate under a ultra-precise synchronized clock. Let's say in nanoseconds. The satellite syncs with each other and your watch sync from time to time by connecting to your phone or computer. Well, the satellites, which are hovering at a very precise location, about 20,000 kilometers high in the sky, are just sending this ultra-precise time to Earth. And although ultra-fast the signal can be, there is a very slight delay caused by the distance between the moment the time is sent and the moment it reached the Earth. When your watch pick up the time from the satellite, it simply calculates the difference between the time it receives and its internal clock to calculate the distance between itself and the satellite. But as your watch receives the signal from several satellites, it is then able to create a triangulation to know its exact position on Earth. Okay, now you know how it works, you have to know that there is three satellite positioning systems. The oldest, GPS for Global Positioning System, belonging to the United States. Then GLONASS, a Russian equivalent, launched a few years later. And finally, Galileo, another equivalent from the European Union. And they all roughly work the same way. But now, back to the watch. All the watches should be able to connect to GPS but some of them will also have the option to connect to GLONASS and or Galileo. The watches released few years back that had the ability to connect to those three systems was only able to connect to one of them at a time. But we see more and more new watches releasing with the option of dual frequency. This means they can connect on two systems at the same time. And technically, that's a good thing. The more satellite your watch can connect to, the more precise, reliable, stable your geolocation will be. And then you can read anything you want on the internet. You will see that one works better in the city, the other one works better in mountain, the other one works better in that part of the world, this one is more precise, this one is more this, this one is more that, and blah 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 blah. This is surely all true, but unless you are a surveyor, we don't really care about all that. In my experience, I connect my watch only to GPS because it consumes less battery and it works very, very well. Look, here I was under a huge bridge in Montreal downtown and I move from the street to the sidewalk and you can see it very well. I was only in GPS mode in a big city under a huge concrete block. 
Really, I have experienced very few GPS anomalies on my tracks. Of course, any watch can record a slightly geolocation error, but for real, it's a technology that works very, very well, even with an entry-level watch. All that to say that don't look at all the stats of the GPS system of the watch you want to buy, it will work great anyway. But yeah, if most of the activity you record are in a terrible GPS reception area, such as Manhattan downtown or on a cliff because you do a lot of climbing, dual frequency is surely a good idea. On the other hand, there is a very variable element from a watch to another, and this is what brings us to the seventh point, which is the earth rate sensor. I think it's safe to say that all the sport watches that release these days, all of them have an integrated earth rate sensor at the back to get the earth rate from your wrist, and that's a shame. By this, I mean that some watches provide such a bad one that in the end, you end up paying for a tool that not only is useless, but also display incorrect data. Fortunately, this is not the case for all watches, but still, it seems that the experience of the earth rate varies from a person to another, depending on several factors such as airiness, the presence of tattoo, and the skin color. The darker the skin is, and the more obstacle they are between the sensor and your veins, the more difficult it is for this type of sensor to visualize your blood flow. So unfortunately, on this point, as it's very from one to another, it is a bit of a dice game to know if it's going to be fine or not. In my experience, I have obtained excellent results with Polar and also with the latest series from Garmin. But still, if you want the most accurate data, it's a chest strap that you want. Personally, I think it's annoying to have while doing a sport activity, and it's either too loose and it's end up falling down, or it's too tight and it's end up giving me cramps. So even if this gives the most accurate data, in addition of being able to give you your breath per minute, I prefer not using it and use the less precise wrist hearth rate to the gain of comfort. Beside the sensor accuracy, there is probably two other things you want to check for your next watch. The first being the recording frequency. During an activity, all the watch I tested monitored my hearth rate in real time, but some of them fell into a completely different mode when at rest. Some will check your hearth rate every 20 to 30 minutes. I find it a bit ridiculous when you want to have a full hearth rate profile. Let's say that I'm sitting at my desk all afternoon and my average resting hearth rate is 52 BPM. But hey, UPS just dropped a package downstairs and the watch decides it checks my hearth rate while I'm climbing in the stairs with that heavy box and that my hearth rate goes at 130 beats per minute. That kind of screw up the previous 30 minutes. Wow, when you have a watch that check it continuously, you're even able to see how long it takes you to recover. A final point to check, and this one is very important if you plan to sleep with your watch, and it's how much of its screen light, the one from the earth rate, escape from the watch. Most are very good and we see their light only very rarely or from a very precise angle. But let's say that this watch woke me up few times because it reads every 20 minutes, it light up very, very brightly, and it lets the light escape on the side even when you wear it on your wrist. I'll let you imagine what it done when you peacefully sleep and then you put your hand next to your head and then suddenly BOOM! It check your hearth rate with its bright green light. Yes, it wake up pretty badly. Oh, and this one also tried to check your hearth rate even if you leave it on the bedside table. 
It makes a pretty great green flashlight in your bedroom every 20 minutes at night. It's really bad when the object that is supposed to check your sleep quality wake you up. Fortunately, that one was a pretty bad example and many others work just fine. Speaking of flashlight, that brings us to the eighth point. Yes, flashlight. Wonder what's the link with watches? Well, let's talk about it. There are four levels in terms of flashlight with watches. The first level is the watches that don't have a flashlight. That's not good. In second, you have the watches with an MIP screen that have the possibility to have a white screen with backlight turn on at max. It may look silly just like that, but trust me, when you are in a very, very dark environment, it gives you just enough light to see what's around you. I already use it to complete a trail at night. It was very dark, no moon, no nothing. It was just pitch black and it made a major difference. On the third level, we have exactly the same principle, but with an AMOLED screen. I would say that it's at least twice as bright. At this level, it begins to be useful a little more regularly. And finally, the ultimate level. We start to see some watches with literally built-in flashlight. You might think it's a gimmick, but trust me, I wouldn't want a new watch without a flashlight anymore. It's a tool that I use at least once a day. It's really, really awesome to find a document in a dark room, to see the trail at night, to create a security light that flash on your wrist when you run at night on the edge of the road, to replace your rear bike light when you forgot it at home before leaving. Really, I use it in many sort of occasions. Next point, the touchscreen. Oh, I tested some watches that have one of the very poor quality, or just badly configured, or badly programmed, or whatever. It was just a terrible experience. Sometime it responds with delay, other time it doesn't do what I want, or in some cases you can clearly see that the Touchscreen is a last minute add-on and that the watch has been designed to be used with its button and well they just put a touchscreen but didn't put the energy into it to make it work well. So for a long time I just hated the idea of having a touchscreen on my watch until I tested one that works well. Smart options which allow me to use the watch more quickly thanks to its touch functions. Fluid, well thought out, well built, under certain circumstances. That is to say that it's great to use when you want to navigate in the menus, the widget, when you want to interact with your watch over an extended period or quickly access an option, but always when you're not doing a sport activity. In activity, you absolutely want your touchscreen to be disabled. And be careful, this is not possible on every watches. The thing with physical activity is that, for example, if you are swimming or just taking a shower, your watch will get wet. And have you ever tried to use your phone when it's raining? It's not great. And even if it's not raining, if you are into a physical exercise, you will probably be sweating. And again, it will not work well as soon as there will be a drop of sweat on your screen. Your screen starts to go crazy, change pages when you don't want to, or prevent you from doing it when you want to, or maybe even worse, in some cases, possibly stop your activity. So you also want to be able to disable it quickly if necessary. The worst is when a watch is made so that you have to use a touch function to access some command. Like this one. The only way to bring up this menu is to swipe your finger down. It is therefore practically impossible to do it when you have gloves on because it's cold or when it's raining, for example. 
It's essential that your watch has been designed to be used with its button and that the touch panel is an optional feature that allow you to use the watch more quickly when it pleases you. For my part, even if the touch function works very well on my watch, I only use it from time to time because I use the buttons most of the time. So in summary, if you absolutely want to have a touchscreen on your sport watch, make sure you can use it without it, that it's well programmed, that it answers well to command, and that you can quickly disable it if needed. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. A big flaw of the touchscreen is that when you use it, your screen gets all dirty because of your greasy fingers. But what I really love about my touchscreen is navigating the map. Well, that's bringing us to the next point. Mapping! And surprisingly, even today, very few sport watches offer that feature. And even fewer offer a very complete one. I will present you this chapter the same way as I did the flashlight a bit earlier, so I will start with the most ordinary example and finish with the best. First of all, some watches will have as only option to help you find your way a compass. It's better than nothing, but you will see that compared to the next features that we will see together in the next few minutes, it's rather banal. At the next level, we find what we call the breadcrumb. The idea is that there is no map on the watch, but as soon as you start an activity, you trace a line on a white page to indicate where you have been. Like throwing breadcrumbs on the ground to help you retrace your steps. No matter where you are, it will help you to get back to where you started. Most watches that offer that option will also have a guidance feature to help you come back on your steps. And in general, there's also something to indicate you the direction and the distance to go in straight line to your starting point in case you want to return by the bushes. The next level is to have a map directly on the watch. For example, you may be able to see roads and trail, Others literally allow you to see street and trail names, parks, mountain top, antennas, the topography of the area, rivers, restroom, restaurant, and a whole lot more. And the ultimate level right now is when you can use this map to navigate. That is to say that you can literally search for restaurants around and the watch will create you a route to get there. You can also use an app on your phone to search for a particular location on a bigger screen and send that location to your watch with a tap or two so it can create a route for you. You can also create routes manually from another application to pass exactly where you want. And with this kind of feature, instead of coming back on your steps, you can literally ask your watch to come back home by the shortest route. Or the flattest one, if you're this kind of guy. There's also some watches that can create you a round-trip course from where you are for the distance you want, with nothing else than just your watch. And this watch do even more, and explaining everything would be really long, so if you're interested into navigation, I invite you to take a look at this video in which I explain a lot of things about it. But if you're the type to venture into mountain, of the trails, or even into big cities you don't know, having a map on your wrist is such a powerful tool that allows you to feel very confident. Because no matter where you go, you can always come back home easily. I want to come back on a point about control. We saw a little bit earlier touchscreen, but now I want to talk about the crown. I didn't spend much time to test that type of control because I only tested two watch that have a crown and they are both from Coros. I think it's a pretty good idea because you can do up, down and select with a single button. This means you can do pretty much anything only with your thumb or your index depending on which side you use the watch. So you don't need to play on every side of the watch, it's all happening at the very same place. It works quickly and intuitively. On the other hand, it may not apply to all watches and all kind of activities, but the problem I had with that 
is that when I was cycling and maybe some other type of sport, there was a moment where I was doing a movement and the back of my hand was pressing on the crown. So as you can see, I have reversed the watch. The crown is now on the other side. We will come back on this later on the video. Uh, but now the problem I had with that is that my jacket was still <laughs> playing with the crown. The watch have a feature to block those unwanted interaction, which proved that it really is a problem. But although it helps, I was still doing some unwanted interactions. And it also make the watch a little bit slower to use because you now need to unlock it every time you want to use it after something like about 15 seconds. Last point, and most people probably don't care, but while a watch is always better to use with bare hands, the crown is probably the worst option after touchscreen when you have big gloves. I mean, here in Eastern Canada, it's important. Gloves are not just a question of comfort, it's a question of survival. So again, it's my personal opinion, but I think that there is no better control input than physical buttons. Well, well, we're there. Let's talk about those buttons. And here, please don't tell me I'm a Garmin fanboy. Yes, I personally prefer Garmin watches for several reasons, but I'm not giving any company any favors here. I'm just listing facts that I realized after testing all of those watches, and I remind you that there is no company that pays me to make that video. I bought all of the watches that I have with me right now, except that Coros that was sent to me by the company. My only condition was that they let me honestly say what I think about it. So there you go. Now I've reassured you about this. Let's continue and you'll quickly understand why I mention it. Garmin has very well developed its button systems. There is no interface on any other brand of sport watches that allow you to make as much with such efficiency. First, five buttons. On the right, you find the select and the back button, while on the left, you find the up and down, and the top one is for the light. You remember earlier when I told you my problem about the crown when I was wearing it on bike, I was pressing it with the top of my hand on certain position. Well, I have the exact same problem with the big buttons on the Sunto 9. I can press it with the top of my hands, and yes, it happened very often. At Garmin, they simply didn't put any button at that problematic place. So, not a problem. At Parler, there is a button at this position, but on this one, it's so thin that it has never been a problem. I just never managed to get used to the position of their buttons. Maybe it's just a matter of habit, but I didn't find it intuitive. The function of the button changed from one menu to another and it became rather confusing. Another thing I like about a good button, it's its confirmation of a press. Uh, let's come back on that Sunto 9. Remember those big buttons? When you press on it, it's like pressing on marshmallow. There is absolutely no confirmation except a vibration that come often in delay. Most watches can also give you an audio feedback when you press that button, but I think it's annoying, so I just disable it on all of my watches. I just want to have a feedback with a click when I press on the button. And Garmin pushed the bar even further. You can program shortcuts to function that you use the most often. It can be by pressing and holding a button or with a combination of two buttons. So you can really personalize your watch as you wish. 
Let's do a quick example here with my Garmin Tactics. This button here is made to start an activity when I'm on the home page, but I program a hotkeys. If I hold it, it brings me to that page to share my hearth rate sensor with my uh, stationary bike. So that's more quickly to go in the menu and do it like that every time. Uh, that button here is made to go down, but if I press and hold it, it brings me to that music app uh, page. And uh, this one, if I hold it, bring me to the menu, but it's made to go up. Uh, and if I press on those two button, it deactivate my touch screen and reactivate it. That's a, uh, a, a hotkeys that I have for gram. And uh, that one, if I press it once, just a click, it uh, turn on the backlight. If I press and hold it, it bring me to those widgets. And if I double click it, it turn on the flashlight. So we could continue to configure it uh, as we wish for a very long time. So in summary, in my opinion, a button should come out just enough so you can feel it, but not too much to be accidentally pressed. It should click when you press on it and have some resistance. Not too hard, not too soft. Ideally, it should be possible to program double function and combination to access personalized shortcuts. And the best button layout is two on the right and three on the left. Remember earlier I told you I would come back on a point about reversing the watch. It's something that yet I only seen at Koros and I think it should be available on all sport watches brands. Most watches are designed to be used on the left wrist because that's how most people use them. But what do we do with the others? I think all watches should be designed to be used as mirror on the other wrist. Certainly we can get used to it, but if this button was designed to be used with the thumbs and this one with an index, it should be so on both sides. The sport mode available in the watch. Let's talk about it. It's probably important in the sport watch, isn't it? Not all watches have a wide variety of activities pre-configured. And depending on what you want to do with your watch, it might be important to have that wide variety of sport available. If you do more than one sport, you can therefore pre-configure the data windows that you will see on each page of each activity. This is important because when you want to ride a bike, you want to know your speed, while when you run, you want to know your pace. And when you're ice skating, you certainly don't care about your vertical speed, while when you swim, the oxygen level is probably the last data you want to bother with. You probably don't want to activate your GPS when you're riding a stationary bike or connect your strike counter when you're doing weight training at the gym. At the speed you reach in alpine skiing, you want to have the most precise satellite precision, but when you go on a week-long expedition in the mountains, maybe you are ready to make some sacrifice so that your battery lasts longer. You see what I mean? Each activity has its own programmable things about what you want to connect, activate and see on the screen, in addition of giving you that nice little logo when you're looking at your activity calendar. Some watches have very little choice in terms of activities, others have more, and the best even goes so far as to make a difference between road bike, mountain bike, gravel bike, touring bike, cyclocross, electric bike, electric mountain bike, stationary, and even your commute. So just make sure the watch you choose can do all the sports you want or almost. If you just miss one or two that you do from time to time, it's not the end of the world either. For example, on my favorite watch, I don't have my famous rollerblade that I do two or three times a year. So on my watch for that kind of activity, I program myself and other. There is unfortunately one last point to talk about into that video, but hopefully we shouldn't have to talk about it anymore in few years. And it's the amount of sport available in the watch simultaneously. Simultaneously. Sim sim simultaneously. Sim Google? Simultaneously. Thank you. 
In the best case, everything is easy and we have a favorite sport menu and a menu for the other sports. But there are still some watches on the market where you have to make a choice from a list and it's those choice that will be available inside your watch until the next time you make some modification and resync it to your watch. Come on, memory cost almost nothing today. Just let me have all the sport available inside the watch without having to synchronize every time. And now let's talk about multi-sport mode. Certainly a feature that will be used by a minority, but on that topic, I realized that some watches do way better than others. But what is a multi-sport mode? So if, for example, you do a triathlon, you will do three sports in the same activity. So you're going to start with swimming and after your 750 meters, you will want to switch to cycling. On the most terrible watches, you will have to simply stop your activity and start a new one. In the center, there is my favorite way of doing it because it required no preparation. When you're done swimming, you press a button, you have a list of all the sport available inside your watch. So you're looking for cycling, you select it and you go for your 20 kilometers. And for the most complete watches, before you start the activity, you can pre-select the sport you're going to do. And at the end of each step, you can even calculate your preparation time between each sport. It gives you the comfort of having all the data on your wrist for all of your sport all along of your activity and the luxury of having a very nice graph at the end of the day. If I was going to do a triathlon or an Ironman, I would definitely go with the option of pre-program my activity. But still in everyday life, I love the fact of being able to switch from an activity to another without preparing anything before the activity. Another point that we should no longer have to talk about today in that area where television, telephone and monitor have practically no more contour is the size of the screen. These days, a screen has to occupy almost the entire surface and watches should not be an exception. Well, almost. Personally, I still like classic watches, so in my mind, a watch should have that beautiful contour, more commonly called a bezel, preferably in brushed titanium or another beautiful, prestigious material. But anyway, inside that famous bezel, the screen must occupy as much space as possible. I still see aberration in some watches that have come out in the last few years and I find it ridiculous to end up with a super big watch but a very small screen. It's gotten to such a point that I've seen medium-sized watches with a larger screen than a big watch. The only possible excuse I can see for the screen not taking up all the rest of the canvas is to leave space for a solar panel like we can see right now. Otherwise, it would be about time to evolve. Yes, a solar panel on a watch. This is my 70th point of this video. Some watches are equipped with that technology and I find it absolutely fantastic. The less I need to charge my watch, the more I like it. But wait, in the case of sport watches, this solar panel would not allow you, at least not with today's technology, to have an infinite charge. No, it only extends the battery lifespan. In smart watch mode, it can significantly increase your charge by a few days if you're regularly exposed to the sun, and in an activity, it can give you a few extra hours. Finally, if your battery is completely dead, you can recharge it very slowly with the light of the sun. It really works. I tested it. I notice, however, that on certain watch models, especially at Garmin, well, yep, they are the only one doing solar sport watch. But anyway, when the solar option is available, it is better to take it. Otherwise, you end up with the useless empty space, as I mentioned earlier. They obviously took the path of laziness by leaving unused space rather than installing a bigger screen, which would surely complicate things on the assembly line. But if you're someone who venture into multi-day or week-long expedition, solar charging is certainly an option that should interest you.
And speaking of charging, we really can't miss this topic. The battery and its lifespan. Personally, I always look for the watch that can give me the longest charge. It's not complicated. My watch is always on my wrist. It wasn't like that before. With my good old Suntio, I was only wearing it to make my sport activity or to go out. But that was in 2012. Now that my watch calculate a lot of stuff throughout all the day, like my hearth rate, my respiration per minute, the number of steps I take, it calculate my quality of sleep, it even gives me the weather, the time at what the sun will set and rise, and it's even my flashlight. No, no, it's something that I won't live without. It's in a way an extension of myself. So I want to take it off as less often as possible. Having a watch that have a charge that lasts more than a week is absolutely brilliant. When I see a watch that claim to check your sleep quality and only have a charge of 36 hours, I can't stop thinking that it will never work. If it give you a lifespan of 36 hours, you will surely recharge it every day because it will not last a second one. And you will probably charge it at night, because in the day you will use it. So, it will never calculate your sleep. A longer battery lifespan is essential for somebody who go on multi-day or multi-week expedition. And it's quite a luxury to not constantly wondering when you're gonna take it off to charge it. But yes, a very long charge of battery come with an hour choice of model, as as it's associated with some other features. It must be a big watch. Yeah, big battery means big watch. It also means that you have a screen that is less pleasant to look at than some other watches. Because yes, an AMOLED screen consumes a lot of energy. And actually, yeah, with the reflection, actually, it might seem terrible. <laughs> oh, and now this one off. <laughs> okay. You will therefore have an MIP screen as we saw earlier. Not unpleasant to look at, just less visible than the AMOLED. Even if you do some tweaking on your AMOLED watch to save some battery, you will always ending up draining faster than the MIP. Anyway, I think you get it. And at this point, it's also a matter of personal choice. Just ask yourself the question. Look at the battery lifespan of the watch you want to buy and ask yourself if you are comfortable with it. Oh. And before we move to the next topic, one thing that I really appreciate is when my watch give me the remaining charge time. Because basically, if now I would go out for a ride and, oh, I only have 6% left, is it enough? I prefer when my watch tell me, well, you have three hours left to do your activity. Oh, so I'm fine. Garmin, again, on this point is absolutely brilliant. I always have an indicator to tell me, depending on what I am doing right now, how much time I have left. So for example, just right now with my 92% of battery in smartwatch mode, I have 27 days of battery. And if I go for a bike ride, well, I will have 80 hours of battery. But if I turn on my flashlight, now I have four hours. And if I keep the flashlight and go out of the GPS activity, I now have five hours. But if I want to have more time of flashlight, I can go to uh, less brighter flashlight and I now have six days of battery. You see, it's brilliant. I constantly see how much time I have left depending on what I'm doing with it. So if I go out to do a GPS activity at night with my music and the flashlight turn on, I can quickly see if I have to sacrifice something to complete my activity. So having a percentage indicator is good, but if your watch can translate it in time, it's way much better. Whoa, and I've just mentioned about music, so let's go in detail into it. Because most watches today have music features. In some case, it's only to control the music of your phone, a kind of remote control. In others, it's literally to store music inside its internal memory and make it play over Bluetooth inside your headphone 
while you're doing your sport activity. We really live into the future, it's incredible. But speaking of that Bluetooth feature, beware. It's great, yes, but it comes at a heavy price. And I'm not just talking about your wallet. It's eat up your battery at lightning speed. Oh yeah, if your goal is to go running without your phone, but with your music, I understand you so much. But as example, know that if you run a little every day and listen to music while you're running, you may have to recharge it every three days rather than every two weeks. Personally, it's not an option that I use that much because I don't run that often, but when I do, I mostly run into nature and in those kind of place I rather listen to winds into the leaves and birds. The option I use the most is when I ride my bike, then I listen to music on the speaker of my phone and I control it over my watch. This way when I arrive at a red light and there are other people, I can quickly stop my music and not disturb everybody with it. I can also play with the volume and skip to the next song. But hey, rather you listen to the music from your phone or from your watch, know that usually it all happens on the control page that you find somewhere on your watch. And what is really important about that page is that it's quickly accessible and always the same way. On some watches, it will be a page in your activity that will be in your way if you don't plan to listen to music this time, or that might be too long to get to because you have given yourself five pages of data. And worse, it might be hidden into a submenu when you're not doing an activity. <laughs> I like when it's quickly accessible from a shortcut button and always the same. So for example, on my watch, I just press and hold that one and I'm on the control page. So anywhere I am on the watch, I'm always at a maximum of two click away from pausing the music or skip to the next track. And that's really awesome. If it's too complicated to use, you will never use it. Also, do your research because some watches that say that they are playing music to your Bluetooth headphone has an only option to import music into it, your MP3 that you send manually into it. Actually, not with a USB key, but you remember, maybe if you are old enough, you connect it to your computer with a USB cable, you have your MP3 files, playlist, or whatever, and you send it into it, and it takes forever, and yeah, like it was in 2000, 2000, <laughs> okay, maybe 2005. Just know that some watches can connect to your Spotify account and sync your playlist when you ask for it. I think it's way better. Next point, the data fields. And what is a data field? It's the information you can see on your watch and this is very interesting. Make sure you pick a watch that is able to give you all the information you want on your wrist while you're doing your sport activity. I'm talking here about speed, pace, average speed, vertical speed, calories, distance travel, or even remaining distance, elevation, hearth rate, cadence, the stopwatch from the beginning of the activity, or maybe the one of the lap, the temperature, the direction, the number of steps, the percentage of oxygen, your power in watts, and even the clock. It's better to have too many data choices than not enough. There are some watches that just for your hearth rate, it can display it in so many ways. Your pulse, your pulse in the gauge graph with a level of one to five, more commonly known as the zone. Your pulse with a chart that show you now compared to the previous minutes. Your pulse on average, or rather than displaying just your hearth rate, it can also display it as percentage of what you can achieve. Like for example, your maximum is 200 beats per minute and your heart rate is at 150. So this means you are at 75%. Or even as a percentage considering the lowest you can go. 
So if your minimum is at 50 and your maximum still at 200 and you're going still at 150, you would rather be at 67%. It could also tell you the time you have spent since the beginning of the activity in a zone. Or it could also tell you all the previous information for the current lap. And maybe even more. And here we're only talking about hearth rate. Imagine all of those variations for all the fields that we have seen a little bit earlier. Like the speed, the distance, the elevation. You get it. In short, you have watches that are limited to some available information. And even worse, I have tested a watch that was able to calculate when I was riding my speed in kilometers per hour or in miles per hour if you're in that kind of country. But when I was walking, the only option I had was my pace. But who are you to decide what I want to see into my activity? Give me the choice, don't force me to use what you think is good for me. Well, I've just realized that this is now a problem solved. They had it into the app. So, thank you. But I can still see that some data fields are only available in some sports. Just let the user choose what they want. Don't limit them to what you think they want. And now back to the video. So again, unless you totally don't care and all you want is your speed and distance, make sure you have a wide selection of data fields even if you won't use half of them. Too much is better than not enough, at least in this case. Another thing that is very important about the data fields is how much you can display on a single page. I like when the watch gives me the freedom of choice. Some will want to have one huge piece of data because their eyes is no longer what they was. Others will want a little more but not too much because it must remain easy to read when you're moving. And in more relaxed sport like walking, I may want to put as much information as possible so that I never have to change pages. I raise my arm and I have access to all the data on the same page rather than pressing a button until I reach the page that have the information that I want. On this watch, I can have access to up to nine data fields at the same time and some fields can even be divided so it can be even more. I can also build myself a page on which I see data from various sites. I often do this to display, for example, my speed in large and right next to it my average speed in small. Another feature that I like, and this one is yet only available at Garmin, is the autoclimb. Like his name says, this feature allows you to automatically switch page when you're climbing a hill. The kind of data that I want to have access when I'm climbing a hill is way different than the one that I have when I'm on the flat. I want to see my vertical speed, my altitude, my elevation gain, or my grade. And when I'm riding uphill, the last thing that I want to do is to have to press on a button to have access to that data. With a Garmin, it can be done automatically if you have taken the time to program it on your sport mode. Last point about the data fields, I love when my watch gives me the freedom to choose what I will have on my watch face. In fact, on almost all watches, we have a choice in relation to the type of interface we want to have, with ends or with numbers, and with some different interfaces. But very few watches will give you a real freedom as to the data fields you see. If you take this interface, you will have your current elevation and um, your number of steps. Why? Let me choose! On my Garmin again. And Sorry, I tried to stay as neutral as possible, but I realized by writing that video that most of the points that I took in note to discuss about into that video are really well developed and thought out only on Garmin. So, on my Garmin tactics, like many other Garmin watches, I choose to have from a range of 22 available data that I was going to have at my disposal at all the time outside of my sport activity the following nine datas. The date and time, my hearth rate, the sun cycle on a graph, the current altitude, the charging time, the current temperature, the maximum and minimum of the day, 
and my number of steps. I was able to select the watch interface, the data displayed, and their layout. This is very well personalized. The only data that is not possible to change, and it's a shame because I'm sure some people would do it, is the big one in the middle. The time. Which bring us to the next point, and this one is very important in my mind. And it's the watch independency. And again, of all the watches I tested so far, only the Garmin ones are completely independent. But what is the watch independency? It is how much your watch need a third-party device like your phone or your computer to work. Several watches I tested definitely need a phone before you can use it for the first time. That doesn't mean you can't go run without your phone. Well, that being said, there are some watches that are dependent to the phone at this point. But I think that if you remain in the four big brands of sport watches, which is Garmin, Coros, Polar, and Sunto, well, in the recent years, I think you can't buy a watch that is dependent to this point. But where I want to go with that is that if you pick another watch than a Garmin one, you will need your phone to do most of the edit on your watch. The danger with that is that the well-being of your watch is totally dependent on the health of the company and their willingness to continue to support your watch for the number of years they want to. And here I can't forget what Sunto did a few years back. My good old MB2 had failed in Geoparty for at least a year. To synchronize the watch, I needed to connect it to MoveScout, which is a web platform that the watch had access through a USB cable connected to the computer and a little software called MovesLink. A few years ago, Sunto, that saw some of their customer move to their new app, the Sunto app, it's a mobile application that was designed for their new watch. Well, seeing that, they decided to shut down MoveScout. When this one announced, my watch and the one of thousands of people was simply going to be forsaken to become a beautiful empty shell. Simply because the company was trying to avoid injecting money in a service to support their very first customers. Naturally, several people, including me, complain. So Sunto developed another application so that we can keep, synchronize our watch. It's not perfect, but almost, so I can complain. But you see how dangerous it is to have a tool that is this dependent to a mobile application. For my Garmin, yes, you can make some edits on your phone. But it's a brand new thing and it's only optional. If we go back of a generation, the only way to do the edits was straight from the watch. And just to be clear, you can always do that. It's just a novelty that you can also do it from the app on the phone. But when you want to edit your own page, your units, your data fields, your type of satellite connection, your hotkeys, download and update your maps, your battery management, change the language, the backlight settings, or even reset the watch to factory default. You can do it all directly from the watch. If Garmin goes bankrupt tomorrow and their Garmin Connect app shut down, the only thing I would really lost in the watch is the weather. Well, maybe also some other things that I don't think of, but the fact that you can connect your watch through USB to a computer to add and extract data is a big plus to our freedom. For sure, it worked better with the app. But the most important thing is that my $2,000 watch doesn't become an empty shell if something happened to the company. And that cannot happen with my Garmin watch because it's totally independent. So, because I've already experienced what it's like to spend $600 
in a watch and overnight the company that built it sent me a message not too clear and a bit awkward telling me that well we are going to do some changes and your watch will no longer be supported well you see why this point is super important for me an independent watch is also a watch resistant to obsolete schedule but over the fact that it guarantee your watch to work for a very long time it's also very handy because you can modify everything straight from your watch so imagine you are into the swimming pool and oh you realize that the length of the pool is not right well you can edit it on the watch or uh, you realize that maybe you want to have the distance you have swum since your last break well you can do it on the watch Garmin is yet the only sport watch company that can offer you that at the moment at Kuros you can also edit your activity while you are into the activity but you need your phone that you left in the locker room at Sunto and Poller, you can also do the edit on your phone that you left in the locker room, of course. <laughs> but even if you get out of the swimming pool, reach the locker room, take your phone, you cannot do the edit until you end the activity on your watch. So you would have to go out of the swimming pool, reach the locker room, end the activity and then go on your phone to the application do the edit sync it to your watch wait for the sync to be done and then you could restart the activity that will have be divided because you did stop the activity to make the edit so suddenly you will probably put the idea on hold and wait for the end of the activity but you will forget to do it at the end of the activity and you will probably keep your watch like this for a while maybe you will think about it one day but you will bear your watch like this in the meantime really it's when you're using your watch doing your sport activity that you are in the best position to know what kind of data you want to have right now we already reached point 22 of that video and this one is about the altimeter but what is an altimeter the altimeter is the tool in your watch that will give you your elevation i realize after testing several watch that most of them have one but only few of them have a good one there is three ways to define your altitude for a watch the first one is by GPS triangulation but I can tell you after testing some watches that use that only tool to get your elevation that it's not so good I mean it work but it's not very accurate let's say for example that you start at the parking lot at the foot of a mountain and you climb the mountain and come back down by the very same trail your watch might tell you at the end that you have climbed 900 meters but you only descend 812 the other much more reliable method is the barometer but what is a barometer well it's a tool that can detect the atmospherical pressure okay but what's the point of having this into a watch well the higher you go in elevation the lower the pressure is and it's like that everywhere in the world so thanks to the barometer your watch can detect your elevation in meter only thanks to its barometer now on the same mountain we could get our 900 meters of elevation gain and when you will go to the descent you may have a variation of zero to five meters and why a variation because it's not perfect either atmospherical pressure changed throughout the day so yeah that might distort your data slightly the best watches therefore have in addition a DEM map 
a digital elevation model. So a map with the elevation data of every terrestrial coordinate. At the beginning of the activity, your watch will therefore use the GPS to locate you, longitude, latitude and elevation. And then it's your barometer that will do the job for the elevation with a little recalibration with the DEM map from time to time. With all that, you should have an almost perfect accuracy. Almost because there's nothing perfect in life. Note that the barometers are generally found on the side of the watch so they can breathe fresh air. On some watches, we can find it underneath and it can tremendously distort your data. The thing is, when it's under the watch, you might sweat a little bit because it's a sport watch after all. And if your sweat reached the entrance of the barometer, everything goes wrong. You get the same phenomenon when you go swimming. We agree that the pressure is very different underwater. Well, the barometer will be very affected by it until it dries up. Don't worry, you won't break it, but going swimming in the lake in the middle of your mountain hike clearly risks disordering your data. Finally, if that's something that interests you, most watches equipped with the barometer also have a storm alert. It's directly connected. It's not complicated. When you have a quick drop in pressure, that means there's a storm incoming. So often, that's an option that you can enable and disable as you wish. The best watches will allow you to adjust its sensitivity. If it's too high, you will often have false alarm and end up ignoring its alert. Even for that time when the big storm was coming. True story. I personally set it to minimum so it rings only when something big is coming. Which is to say almost never. All that to say that if the elevation data is something important for you, make sure you take a watch with the minimum of a power meter. And if it's really, really important for you, take one with a DEM map integrated. Oh, some watches can also read the DEM data in synchronization to your phone. But you know what I think about the importance of having an independent watch. One of the questions that I've been asked so many times is how much water resistance it is. Well, it's different for every watch, so if you want to know, you will need to go on the manufacturer website, find your watch model and go into the spec section. From there, you will look for the ATM grading. ATM is a chart that is used by every watch manufacturer in the world to indicate its resistance to water pressure. ATM is not an acronym, it's simply the short of atmosphere. The higher the number is, the more the watch is resistant to water pressure. And for everyday life, I recommend a minimum of grade 5. We will see together what means all of those grades and I take the definition directly on the Garmin website. At 1 ATM, your watch can withstand the pressure equivalent to 10 meters underwater. In everyday life, this means that your watch can resist to rain, snow, shower, and a light splash. Basically, don't go swim with it. Resisting to a pressure equivalent to 10 meters underwater doesn't mean that you can bring it there. Just think of the pressure you get when you dive into water. At your point of entry, it is much greater than the pressure at 10 meters deep. At 3 ATM, you got a resistance equivalent to 30 meters deep. It says that you can jump into water at that stage. But still, that doesn't mean it's a good idea to go swimming with it. At 5 ATM, which was my earlier suggestion as minimum for everyday life, you got a pressure equivalent to 50 meters deep and it's way much interesting. You no longer have to rack your brain. Your watch can follow you pretty much everywhere. You can now swim with your watch or snorkeling. And be careful, I said snorkeling, not scuba diving. I mean, you can dive, but just a little bit. You must remain in shallow waters. Just be careful when you enter the water, though. As I said earlier, you can reach a pressure equivalent to more than 50 meters deep on the surface of the water when you break the surface. I'm thinking, for example, if you're canyoning, jet skiing, or diving from the 5 meters at the swimming pool. For this kind of activity, you will rather want to watch with the 10 ADM grade. 
With that, you really have a peace of mind and that's what I have on my favorite watches. Basically, you can do pretty much what you want in water apart from diving more than 100 meters deep. Well, I just want to make sure to not have been misunderstood here. Don't try to dive up to 100 meters with that kind of watch. It's not made for that. If you want to dive up, up or down to 100 meters deep, you will need a diving watch. This is totally different. Uh, and I'm not really gonna talk about those kind of watch. This is a video about sport watches. Diving watches is another topic and I'm not specializing to that. But uh, if you want a diving watch, you will not looking for an ATM grade, you will look for a diving grade. So those watch will said uh, dive and the number of meters you can go down. ATM 10 can resist to a pressure equivalent of 100 meters deep, but it doesn't mean you can dive down to that pressure. So yeah, you can dive, but not, not down there. I mean, it's not a diving watch, so don't take a 10 ADM grade watch if you want to dive. Take a diving watch. But if this weekend you want to dive a little bit that few meters deep, well, go ahead. You're fine. That's all right. Just don't try to reach that 100 meter. I don't know much about diving, but it seems that when I reach the bottom of the 4 meter at the swimming pool, it's already a lot of pressure. So I don't think it's really good for the human body anyway at 100 meters deep. Unless maybe your name is Hebert Nitsch. Well, this guy is an Austrian and he have the world record for the deepest free diving at 214 meters. And yes, I said free diving. This is probably unimportant for most people to care about, but there's another point of resistance to check in some cases. And it's the resistance to temperature. Each electronic device has its limit of resistance to cold and heat. Well, unless you're a volcano explorer or pass the most of your life in saunas, the heat shouldn't be a problem. But for the cold, well, check. On my watch, it says that it can be used from plus 45 Celsius to minus 20, and it have to be recharged between zero and 45. Well, as Canadian, I tested it at much colder than minus 20, and it still works very well. But we must not forget that the watch was on my wrist, which gave off heat in addition of being partially at shelter in my coat. For sure, in case of extreme cold, you can hide it under your jacket. If it reach minus 20 there, you will have much bigger trouble than your watch anyway. But it's just not practical if you want to navigate or just read your data because, well, it's out of sight. So just think about the sport you would like to do with it and choose wisely. Storage. <laughs> I can't believe it every time I talk about it in my video reviews, but there is a simple thing that some watches can't do. And that's really stupid shutting down. If you're like me and you wear your watch 24 seven, you probably don't care about it. But for the Sunday runner who prefer to have its wrists at fresh air for the rest of the week, or just wear its beautiful Seiko for the rest of the time, it's a bit pitiful that this watch cannot just turn off. That is to say that while waiting for your next activity, your watch will simply discharge slowly. And maybe that the next time you will need it, well, uh, the battery is dead. So, I'll go run without it. If you unbox your watch and the very first thing you have to do before you can use it is to charge it, well, you've just buffed one of those watches. There is so no way to shut them off that even the manufacturer is not able to do it. So the time it passed between the factory, the distributor, the retailer and the foot of your door, well, yeah, 
you receive a watch with an empty battery. To date, I only seen those kind of situation with Sunto and Polar, but yet Polar correct the situation on my watch, so now it's fine. So Sunto, come on. The quality of sleep tracking really varies from watch to watch, but also from user to user. Some watches will only monitor your sleep duration, but some others will do way much more by telling you at which period of the night you were in deep sleep, light sleep, REM or awake. It's really surprising how much it can do, but all the watch I tested gave me some doubt about its ability to be accurate. The point is that the first thing I do in the morning, after a quick trip to the bathroom and brushing my teeth, is that I answer my comment. Yes, the one that are right below the video. And sometimes, even my favorite watch gives me some trouble with that part of the day. Because yes, it says that when I'm answering my comment, that I'm light sleeping. Really? My favorite watch to monitor my sleep was this one, the Polar Critics Pro. That was the one who gave me the most detail and it felt more accurate. Its graphic is also always very interesting to look at. And while we're talking about sleep, let's talk about the night mode of watches. Because when you sleep with your watch on your wrist, the very last thing you want is that it wakes you up with a vibration in the middle of the night because Bob decided to send you the latest stupidity he found on TikTok. But even today, there are some watches that, despite the fact that the company talk about their sleep mode in their sale pitch, that dare to release it without a simple automatic do not disturb mode or a feature that will at least help you to sleep with it. Or even worse, I tested a watch that even if it was totally aware that I was sleeping, yeah, because it was tracking my sleep, it wasn't able to disable the automatic backlight of the watch. So imagine you're sleeping peacefully, and then at some point you move your arm next to your face, and that's the movement. So the backlight turn on right in your eyes. Seriously, come on. You cannot interfere with my sleep when your job is to monitor it. To be clear, I never tested a watch that didn't wake me up at least once. But there are some watches that do it way less often than others. Even my Garmin is not perfect on this point. It's almost perfect, but there's a flaw. The thing is that there's an automatic do not disturb, so I can program that at this time. Well, you fall in do not disturb mode, so I'm sure to not be waking up at night. But what I realize is that when I'm active at this time, so into a sport activity, well, it ignore that do not disturb activation. So sometime I get a notification during the night. But it do better on some other points, so when it detects that I'm asleep, it fall into night mode, so it do some kind of lot of stuff that makes sense, like uh, dimming the backlight, so it, it's not super bright when you're sleeping and you just want to take a look at the time. On most other watches, seriously, it's just pathetic if you want to sleep with it. There are not many things that have been thought to avoid interfere with your sleep unless you want to go change two to four parameters every evening and morning. Some have a do not disturb mode, which is great, but you have to think to enable it in the evening and disable it in the morning. The automatic backlight movement that I was talking about earlier, I saw it on so many watches outside of Garmin. Really, if it's important for you to have a watch that will monitor your sleep, make sure you pick a watch that won't hand it.
And now to talk about quality of sleep without talking about what's break it. The alarm. A watch that doesn't have one shouldn't be called a watch. Fortunately, all the watches I have tested have one. But some have one way better than others. In my opinion, a good alarm on the watch should have the following features. Have the ability to only vibrate. It's on your wrist. What's the purpose of ringing? Over that, if you don't sleep alone, you won't wake up your loved one or your roommates. And even better, and actually only Pollard do this, this watch have the ability to start vibrating very low and then it increase slowly and then it increase and then it increase and then if it's not enough it will start ringing at a very low volume that will also increase with the vibration that is fantastic the watch should also give you the option of setting this alarm just once or to program it for the day or the days of the week you want. Some watch, like this Poller with its fantastic vibration, will only give you the option of ringing all days or Monday to Friday. Why? I just want to schedule an alarm for Wednesday and Friday at 5.45 to go to the swimming pool. And on some watches, it's just not possible. I have to think about it every night before I'm going to bed. It's so frustrating for a beautiful piece of technology that is able to tell you exactly where you are on Earth with your elevation and reading your heart rate from underneath your skin. Now that you're awake, do you want something that motivates you to move? Personally, the simple fact that all the activity I do is recorded on a calendar and that I can have, over the time, a cumulative of everything that I do is enough to motivate me to move. But if having something on your wrist that congratulate you every time you walk 200 steps or climb a floor, well, that does exist. So if that's something that interests you, know that there are watches that are specialized into that kind of things. Well, it made me think that even though I normally don't like those type of alert, there is a watch that did it in a way that I liked. Again, the Polar Gore-Tex Pro. Every 55 consecutive minute of total sedentarity, so when I'm working at my desk or watching a movie, the watch tells me that I have five minutes to take action. Normally, I would totally don't care about this kind of alert. But the thing is with that watch that if I don't move, I will have an inactivity stamp on my calendar and it will stay there forever. And it was working. I was doing burpees next to my desk every hour. While I think about that, maybe I was also getting up from the couch to get some chips. So anyway, if that's something that interests you, that might be another thing to consider for your next watch. Unfortunately, none of these watches have a USB-C connector. No, it's always a proprietary connector. It's perhaps understandable with those super waterproof watches that the standard USB connector is it an option. But some watches have way better connector than others. In the end, they all do the same thing. It's just that I like of a USB connector to be simple to connect and that I can do it eyes closed. A bit like that or like that. You can connect it on both sides, the connector is solid and we don't have to worry about this connection while left unintended. I think very strongly to the famous Sunto clamp when I say that because I rarely managed to connect it on the first try and how many times I was about to do my activity and realized that because it has moved a little, charging has stopped and I had only 10% left. Or the polar magnetic connector, which although magnetic, is not so easy to align either. 
or the other weird pseudo thing that looked like a pre-kindergarten student's plastic art project. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but really, it's tedious and unpleasant to connect. <sighs> Let's stay here, it's comfortable. <laughs> We've already reached point 31 of this video and we're now gonna talk about antennas. Yes, watches can have several antennas. The one that we will find the most is the Bluetooth, ANT and ANT Plus. They are mainly used to connect accessories to your watch, such as chest, earth rate, stride counter. You can also connect accessories on your bike that will check for your power, your cadence. You can even buy a derailleur that is compatible with your watch today. You also got rear light on your bike that can be controlled by your watch. You could also connect your watch to your emergency GPS, a dog tracker, or your stationary bike. There's even stuff for golf. Truly, the possibilities are endless. If you buy any new accessories today, the chances that they are Bluetooth are almost absolute. But if you bought one or some several years ago, they are probably ANT or ANT+. Plus. So if you already have a device that you want to connect to your future watch, make sure that this watch will be compatible with that technology. The Bluetooth connection will mostly be used for configuration between your phone and your watch or synchronization after you have done an activity. But in some cases, as we have seen earlier, it can also be used to listen to music with your Bluetooth headphone. Some watches even have a Wi-Fi antenna. But this is probably the least useful antenna on a watch, as it's mostly used to synchronize your activity or to update your watch. But you can usually do those kind of thing by the ticket of your phone with the Bluetooth connection if you have one, and it's probably draining less battery. Finally, some watches also have a cellular antenna. The only watch I tested with that feature is the Garmin for Runner 945 LTE, I sold back that one. In this case, its only function was to allow me to share my geolocation for a few dollars a month and to receive notification from my contact via a Garmin platform, or even audio message in my headphone if they were connected. All this at the cost of a battery that drained itself as a Formula One gas tank. Very fast. I find the idea good, but not that useful, as I can do it with my phone anyway and it dress less battery. Let's talk about that position sharing feature. Of all the watches I tested so far, only Garmin does it on pretty much all of their watches, and I think it's pretty awesome. The option is called Lifetrack. And as its name suggests, it allows you to share your geolocation in real time. Uh, well, at 30 to 60 seconds interval or so. It share your position with the contact of your choice or publicly. It's up to you. It can also do it automatically at every beginning of your activity or manually just when you want it. I think it's a good idea to share your location with at least one person when you're going into an adventure, just in case it happens something to you. It's also practical to share it with your girlfriend. This way, she will stop asking you when you will get back home. She will see that you are 50 kilometers away. Or on the other side, you could start cooking dinner so that it's ready just in time for her arrival. Of course, for all of this to work, you will need an internet connection. Your watch can pick that connection through your phone if it's connected to the internet. Otherwise, you can access it through the LTE connection of your watch if it has one, if you're paying for the service, and if you are into a coverage area. Pair with that, there's another feature on Garmin watches, and it's the incident detection. This will send an alert message with your geolocation to up to three of your contacts if the watch ever detects that something is wrong. When that happens, the watch starts beeping for a few seconds before sending the alert so you can cancel it in case it's a fault detection. I hate that feature since it cut in half one of my longest rides because 
someone was asking me for a direction. So I suddenly break and well, I didn't realize that the watch was beeping. So it cut my activity in half and send the alert to my contact. I already got also a false detection at the end of a hike because I was tapping my shoes together to remove all the mud from the sole. Oh yeah, and again, you need an internet connection for this to work. Next point, the wristband. Yes, that things that wrap up around the part of your wrist that the watch doesn't cover. I think it's a major factor of the watch, so I think it deserves a little attention. We'll talk about that one quickly because I will make a full video on that topic because I tested a lot of them and there's a lot to say. But it seemed that as a general rule, most of the sport watches come with a silicone band. Silicon, 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 silicon. Most of them. It does the job very well, but it's not my favorite type of band. Surprisingly, most breathe relatively well. It's a band that is often quite robust and at the same time flexible which will probably end up breaking over time in the hole you use the most, at least in my experience. Fortunately, a band can be replaced. On some watches, it's quite a headache or a task that required a lot of dexterity. On others, it's much more simpler. What's great when you have a watch on which it's very easy to replace is that you can have a watch that just fits everywhere. You can put the orange band on it or just a very comfortable one during your physical activity and another much more check for when you go out to see your friends and family. I think my favorite strap material is nylon, simply because it breathes really well. My wrist never gets wet. It really is comfortable and contrary to what you might think, it dries very quickly. This one is probably my favorite. And again, you can find all the product that I talk about with the links in the description. It's very rigid, but above all, very sober and just fit everywhere. As nice to use on the bike, at the pool, or for dinner. This one is much more flexible and light, but not as aesthetic in my opinion. Another one that I love is the vented titanium one. In my opinion, the most beautiful and surprisingly comfortable even into sport activity. The only time it bothers me is when I'm typing on my laptop. It's always hanging on the edge of my computer. The Italian leather one is also really great. All the band I've just presented are from Garmin. It is in my opinion the only company that developed a beautiful range of bands for its watches. There really is something for all tastes and budgets. So what is really important to take a look at before you buy your watch if you plan to change your band from time to time is the attachment system. The standard is to have this small strip of metal running through the logs. To install the band, simply remove the pin and slide the band on it before reinserting it in place. The band that I showed you earlier can also be installed on this type of frame. Only you don't have to remove the rod, it just grab onto it. And no, you don't have to worry about losing your watch, it's very solid. The other thing you have to look at is the compatibility of band you can install on it. They don't all have the same width. You must find the measurement in millimeter that is sometimes written under the watch or the wrist, but for sure it's written on the manufacturer website. Oh yeah, and while I think about it, if you have a very big wrist, Check the measurements of the wrist that come with your watch to make sure you can wear it. I've heard more than on some people complain that the band is too small for them. Now let's talk about smart features because year over year, smart watches become more and more connected to your phone. But beware, they remain above all sport watches. Smart watches and sport watches remain two total different worlds. On your sport watch, you can expect to see the notification that come to your phone transferred to your watch. 
And if you have a very, very good watch, you will even be able to reply to the messages that come in with the pre-programmed message. <laughs> no kidding, it's pretty much there that it's top today with sport watches. The best watches can also give you the weather if it's connected to your phone. On some, you can also follow the stock market, but hey, on a watch screen, it's worth what it's worth. Well, I'm actually editing that video and I just thought that I passed quite quickly on the weather because actually this is something that I really like of my watch, especially in winter, just before I go outside, do my daily activity. I just raise my arm and take a look at my watch. I know what the temperature is outside, how, what, what, what will I wear to, to go outside today because it varies a lot in, in winter. So that's very, very convenient. And that's straight on my watch face. And if I want to know more, if I want to know about the forecast for the next few hours or maybe in the next few days, even uh, I'm just two click away to see that forecast. Uh, so yeah, that's a wonderful feature that well, I don't want to watch that don't have it anymore. Some watches will also have a feature to let you pay with your watch. Just check with your bank if it's compatible with it. In my case, it's not. Some watches can make your music play to your headphone, but we already talked about that a little bit earlier. Oh yeah, and you may also be able to take a call. Actually, you can make your phone answer the call because you will still need your phone to talk. Anyway, that's what I was saying. In that area, sport watches might look outdated compared to a smartwatch. But like I said, it's because it's two total different world, yet. For the next point, we will talk about a feature that unfortunately is not available on all watches. Resume an activity later. Yes, it seems banal, but there's very few watch that can do it. It's an option that I use, for example, when I'm on a bike ride and I stop at a restaurant. I don't want to pause the activity and leave it on the activity page because I know myself, I know that I will forget to restart my activity. And it keep draining the battery because you are still into your activity and it keeps the connection with the satellite. On the best watches, there is a feature to pause your activity and resume it later. So it takes you out of your activity page and bring you back to your watch face. You can wait as long as you want before resuming your activity and it doesn't drain your battery. Oh, and over that, as it gives you the comfort to go back to your watch face, you can see the time, the date, and all of those, those time you want to see when you're eating. <laughs> you don't want to see your speed, your distance, and those kind of thing while eating. And, and <laughs> as it doesn't show you your speed, when you will jump back on your bike, you will quickly realize that you didn't have to restart your activity because you can't see your speed. Before this feature exists, I was simply letting my watch run while I was in the restaurant or whatsoever. And that was terrible because as I was inside, there's a roof, the GPS signal is terrible. So it was doing a bunch of false movements and disordered my data at the end of the day. Next point, muscle training. If that's important for you, you could absolutely appreciate a watch that can build you training program and even show you exactly what to do with animation. This one allow you to create your own training program by yourself or to follow those suggested by the watch. You can indicate the load you lift and the repetition you do, calculate your effort and rest time. Personally, it's not a feature that I use very deeply, but I think it's very well done and for sure useful for a lot of people. Another point not to underestimate is the manufacturer's application for your watch. It's the app that you will use to see all the results of your activities. This is also where you can plan all your route and a lot of stuff related to your watch. For me, the most important thing is that my activity are synchronized with Strava and that pretty much all watches can do it. 
But if you really want to look at all the statistics in detail, you will find them all on the app. And that is really a personal choice. Substantially, you will always find the same information, but displayed in a different way. Please note that some watches also have a web interface. When I finish my activity and I just want to take a quick look at my statistics, yeah, I like to do it on my phone. But when it comes to prepare the route of my next expedition, I really want to do it on my computer. It's not questionable. There's no way I'm going to do it on my phone. So if the computer platform is important for you, you better choose a watch that offer this option. For my part, my two favorite apps are the Garmin one for all its versatility. Yes, it is really very complete. But the one I find the most fun to consult is the Polar one. I like their graph and the layout of their data. I think it was on that one that I had the most fun to look at my statistics. Next point, the languages available. Personally, I always use my electronic devices in English because I saw too many time translation errors that make no sense. I'm French Canadian, by the way. But also because it's not uncommon to see some bugs here and there when a device doesn't work in the language it was programmed. But if it's important for you to use your watch in your native language, check if it's available on the watch of your choice. Penultimate point, the price. <laughs> but here, only you know how much you're willing to put into a watch. But remember one of my favorite proverbs, I'm not rich enough to buy cheap product. If you haven't seen the video on that subject, the link is in the description or right here on the upper right corner. If I still have place to put it, I can put only five of them actually and this video is in French sorry but you can activate the subtitles but hey expect to spend at least few hundred dollars euros pounds franc crown or whatever currency you use I would say that right now you can start finding good watch starting at three hundred dollars I'll get back to you with a few suggestions in just a moment but be careful, you can buy very bad watches for more money. But from $300, you generally have something good. By spending more money, you will have more features, of course, but you will also have a bigger battery, better quality materials, and probably a better look. The one I keep on my wrist normally, <laughs> because actually I just change watch from a sequence to another, well, the one I keep normally, this one, worth around 2,000 Canadian dollars with taxes. And this is not even the most expensive. There really is something for every budget. And we finally reached the very last point, my watch suggestions. By the way, I do a review of all the watches I buy. You can see those review on my unboxing channel. That's another channel I have. So I'll leave you a link in the description if you want to access the playlist and see all of them. If I were you and about to buy a new watch, I would take a look at that if you want to know what to expect. So I will recommend three watches according to your needs and Without a surprise, they are three Garmin's. In my opinion, they just do the best watches, so I won't see myself recommend anything else. And if you want to buy one of those watches, you can use the link in the description. And if you do it, thank you. It's the very same price for you, but I receive a commission out of it. And it's thanks to those income that I'm able to make those kind of video, like this one you've just watched that I work on since over a year now. So every year, my favorite series of watch is the Garmin Phoenix. It's the watch per excellence without compromise. It pretty much do everything or maybe almost everything I just talked about in that video. It is made with quality materials. It is by far the best navigation tool. I have nothing but praise for this series of watch with each new model. It also offers a great diversity in the choice of color and even size. 
The Phoenix series also has some brother models which meet more specific needs such as the Apex which has an AMOLED screen or the Enduro with its huge battery to track you even longer and finally the Tactics which meet certain military needs. This is the one I carry on my wrist every day. I chose it simply because I think it looked better. It's one of the most expensive series of watches, but believe me, if you do sport quite often, and especially if you do a lot of outdoor activities, it will become a part of you. The next model is the Forerunner 900. And there, be careful when I say 900. Forerunners are kind of hard to follow. With the Phoenix, it's simple. You've got the one, two, three, and now we've reached seven. In the Forerunner, you kind of have four series, one in the 900, another one in the 700, the other one in the 200, and the other one is below 100. If I'm not mistaken, it always finish by 5, and they go up by 10. So the one I tested was the Forerunner 945, which is now a legacy model because they released the 955. So after 945, it's 955. So probably the next one will be 965. Anyway, basically you will find substantially the same features as the Phoenix series, but in a plastic case. This therefore reduces costs, but also the weight of your watch. Finally, the model that I recommend to everyone that is not ready to put so much money on the watch is the Garmin Instinct. If you can afford the latest generation model, go for it. But the first generation is still on sale and at such a ridiculous price for everything it does. Really, in terms of capacity, it is comparable to a watch that sells for 5 to 10 times the price. Be careful, I didn't say as good, I said comparable. In my opinion, its only real con is the look. But that's a matter of taste. Well, I've just gave you my personal suggestion, but as I told you at the beginning, everybody has its personal needs. So still, use your good judgment with all the information I've just give you to make your choice. I allow myself to talk to you about those three models because they are really very versatile. So there you have it, that's it for today, I hope it was helpful and I also hope that you have a good idea of what will be your next watch now. If you have any questions, please use the comment down the video, I still read them every day and I answer to most of them. Don't try to contact me anywhere else. The, the comment just right there is the perfect place. And if you want to learn more, take a look at the video down in the description, there's a lot of video down there. With that, Take care and see you soon. See ya.